So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I didn't think you did me justice, actually. Uh, I didn't understand a word of it. Um, <laughs> so firstly, thank you. I'm actually honoured to be in front of what could be Estonia's uh, brightest and youngest uh, entrepreneur and startups. Uh, I believe you guys are shortlisted for the biggest uh, startup competition in Estonia. Um, so bright futures ahead, I guess. Uh, so, my name is Thomas Howard, uh, I'm from the Technical University of Denmark, and I was traditionally a mechanical engineer, but then thought, okay, mechanics is interesting, but I'd like to see uh, what to do with the mechanic. So I started looking into uh, mechanical design uh, and engineering design, and then I thought, well, it's all very well designing these mechanical products, but have, have they got a use case? Where are they going to be put in situations? So I moved then further on into product development, and then I thought, well, it's all very well having a use case, but if they don't have any commercial um, uh, business model behind it, they're also pretty useless. So I kept moving out more towards the product development and business dimension of mechanical design. So I'm going to talk to you today about design and product development in general and how it relates to some of your, your projects. Uh, just a little bit of information about me. Um, I grew up in a little town in North Wales, well it's actually the island of Britain, then an island called Anglesey, and I live on an even smaller island off that, called Holy Island. Uh, that's where I grew up, and then I went to university in the University of Bath, um, where I did my PhD and my fellowship, and then I worked in the manufacturing advisory service down the southwest of England. Um, and then eventually I took a, a professorship over at the Technical University of Denmark, which is where I'm currently working with the uh, section of engineering design and product development. Um, just to give you a little bit of background of my, my interest in this type of course, I teach a course at the Technical University of Denmark, which is called Innovation in Product Development. And we have a similar competition to what you have, the largest one in Denmark, which has 10 finalists, it's called the Venture Cup. And from those 10 finalists, three came from my course last year. Um, so it's got a, a reasonably good structure for developing uh, startups, or at least uh, getting some funding to start the startup. Um, just to give you a bit of background about my research, well, some of the companies I've worked with are the Manufacturing and Biosystem Service, companies such as Airbus, Crown Packaging, the largest metals packaging manufacturers in the world, BMT is a nautical defence company, uh, Joe Bird, a uh, fire hydrant supplier, Taunton Aerospace produced these probes for, for aircraft to measure uh, pressure. Uh, Apex Pumps, a pump supply. Currently working a lot with a company called Nova Nordisk, who produce insulin pens uh, in Denmark and also Bang & Olufsen at the moment. Interesting thing is, when you look at these products, they couldn't really be more different, ranging from the design of aircrafts to the design of consumer electronics. The nice thing is, the skills you have can be completely transferred from one design situation to another. So a lot of the skills that we have as designers can be completely transferred, which is, which is a good thing. Um, and also design in practice, I've started up a, uh, my own locums agency, I've developed my own uh, skincare products, I developed a, a product which is uh, made for securing artwork in museums called Artsma, which won a BMW Scientific Award. I've started up my own ICT business, well we're starting up at the moment, called Fraudin. I've helped develop this uh, security system for laptop bags, um, and I'm developing my own brand uh, called Tanzarella, which I'll, I'll come back to later. So I've got an interest in this area of doing it as well as teaching it. So the agenda for today, we're going to start off talking about integrated product development, um, then we're going to look at product service systems as a strategy, so it's putting a service around your product, then open design or open source design, and finally finishing with uh, protocolation. How can you test your product in its marketplace? So, uh, if any of you watched The Simpsons, you may be familiar with this episode, uh, which is where Homer starts up his uh, internet business where he calls himself the Internet King. And he basically uh, puts his advertisements on the, the internet and he gets customers coming in to his Internet King shop and saying, well, we'd like a, a T1 connection which is compatible with our current internet and so on. And he sits there with a black face and says, can I have some money now? Um, 
is basically got nothing to sell. So the reason I'm really interested in the product development side of business is because rather than when I go to business schools where you use the beautiful business models and then a black box which says, please engineers, sort this solution out for us. Uh, I'd rather develop some of the products and the value to begin with before the business model. So there are two schools of thought as I see it from the management literature. Either we have a causation model, which is uh, you come up with a, a business value proposition and then try and work out a means to achieve the proposition. So you come up with your business model and then come up with your product to achieve it. Or the effectuation side, uh, which is becoming extremely popular at the moment and it's getting a lot of um, publicity, which means you start with what you have available, what you have within your grasp, and try and create some kind of business proposition from that, and then you develop both at the same time. Now, just out of interest, who has heard of the perfectuation as a term? Okay, just a couple. But it may be something worth looking into, but the interesting thing is, this is what we always taught in product development. And we took it through um, the designing mindsets and integrated product development. So we say the designing mindset is to explore and develop the market, the product, and its production simultaneously in an integrated fashion. Uh, to, to produce a more optimal business proposition. So essentially the three strands of integrated product development are developing the market, the product, and the production to produce your business. So if you have a notepad and pen available to you now, uh, I'm just going to take you through a very simple couple of exercises to demonstrate the principles behind integrated product development. While you're doing that, there's some recommend reading from uh, a distinguished professor in my university called Moins Andres and Lars Hein. This is the book on integrated product development. By the way, you're going to have to do some exercises and activities today and give me some uh, audience participation. It's not going to be a two hour lecture, which I, I hope you're pleased about. Okay, really simple exercise. You have six numbers here, and you have to use these functions uh, and using as fewer numbers of these as possible to produce what comes up in this box. So 25, we may do 7 minus 2 times by 5 equals 25. So that's just a simple version. So we'll go to the one that you've got to do now. So write down these seven numbers, and you've got to use plus, minus, multiply, divide in the brackets. You're not allowed to use the same number twice. And you have to use as few of the numbers as possible. So now, the first target, what I want you to do is try and get the number 24. Using as few numbers as possible. So once you've done that, what I want you to then do is cross off the numbers that you've used. And now with the remaining numbers, again, using as few numbers as possible, try and get the target of 12 with the remaining numbers. And then you guessed it. Cross off the numbers that you've used again. So you should only have a few numbers left by now, I guess. And the final target I want you to get as close as you can to is the number four. So how many of you actually hit the target? You're a good group then, because quite often somebody says they have and it means they've done the, the exercise incorrectly. Um, how many were in, within one point of the final target? So how many got three of the final one, or five? One guy, okay. So hopefully this, you'll be able to see this as a metaphor for over the wall product development or sequential product development. And quite simply, if, we, if each department deals with its own needs, the marketing department may suggest a constraint set or 
requirements set out 24 and suggest that is the perfect product for our market that we want to hit. And they send that over to the designers and they say, this is what we need to hit. So the designers then, the designers then say, okay, well, the perfect product we want to achieve is, is 12 using these numbers. Now I'll pass it over to the manufacturer and say, can you produce this? And the manufacturers say, uh, well, actually, we can't produce it, but we can produce something similar. But this is typical sequential over the wall product development. Now I want you to try the same exercise, so if you wouldn't mind just writing those numbers down quickly again. Except this time, I don't want you to do it in sequence, I want you to do it in an integrated fashion. So the marketing department, the stylists and the manufacturers all sit around the table together and say, here are our requirements. So now as the designer, see what you can do. See if you can match these numbers up to these requirements. You can only use them once. It's not a puzzle, it's not a Sudoku that you have to work out, but the, the principle is you should have been able to hit all, all three targets, and if you've done it correctly, you'll probably have one number left over. So that shows the, the difference between tackling the problem in an integrated fashion as opposed to sequential. So does this really relate to product development? Well, I can tell you, yes, it does. The role of the product developer is to juggle the needs of all the stakeholders try and come up with this optimal solution along the way that it meets all of their needs at the same time. If you try to deal with one need at a time, you'll impose constraints which will affect other stakeholders <coughs> later in the process. So just to put that in the context of product development, the constraints imposed by design decisions cause compromise for other stakeholders. Furthermore, product development is a lot more complex than this simple numbers game. There are a hell of a lot more stakeholders involved. And also, it's compounded by the problem that nobody, no single person knows how any product is made in its entirety. In fact, there's a paper written suggesting nobody even knows how a product like a simple pencil is actually made in terms of how the raw materials are extracted, how they get to the manufacturing point, how they're then processed and assembled within each other, how they're packaged, how they're distributed to the sales point. No single person knows about this entire process. So how are we supposed to know about the needs of each of those stakeholders along the way? It's very important and it's a real challenge for product developers, but that is your challenge. <clears throat> this is one of the most important diagrams in engineering design, and it's called Theory of Dispositions. And during the early phases, and this is the time axis, during the early stages of a product, we don't use a great deal of cost. I mean, basically, we're just using our time, a few sketches and so on. So we're actually using not a great deal of cost. But at some point, we need to start prototyping our, our products. But at some point, we need to invest in manufacturing equipment. At some point, we need to buy raw materials and start ramping up production. And as you go towards the deadline of the product, the cost as it is, the decisions you make at the early stages about your design have greater effect on the outcome than anything else. So every single decision you make at the start of your project has a big impact on where this point finally ends up, whether it ends up here or here. So this is called the theory of dispositions. <clears throat> now, I, I'm not too familiar with how 
familiar you are with product development. I know you're, you're entrepreneurs of some kind. Uh, but we're just going to go through a, a quick uh, exercise now that you can shout out. In the development of a product like an iPhone, can you think of any other stakeholders which are affected by your design decisions of this product? So, pretty simple question. The design decisions affect the engineering department. Of course, they affect the users or the operators of the phone. The size of the product affects shipping and distribution, and perhaps the weight of the product does as well. <coughs> what other stakeholders are affected? Factory workers. Uh, uh, on the assembly and manufacturing line, you mean? Yeah, that's a good one. Any other suggestions? Must be able to think. Go ahead. Marketing. Marketing. Good one. Very important. Uh, third party party developers. Very good one. Particularly for this product because you have the, the apps associated with it. Any more? Designers. The designers. The designers of this. Um, the spider of it. Quite. Well, just to give you a few, you've mentioned a few already, but we have. Things such as sales and retailing, purchasing, quality control, assembly, disposal, manufacturing, suppliers and third party suppliers, legal departments. So when you design this and you think, okay, this is exactly how it's going to look, and I love this, this aluminium, it's, it's the perfect brushed aluminium I want, or titanium. Then we realize, okay, we're going to produce it in China, but the only place that they produce this particular grade of aluminium is in the United States, and then we've got to transport all the raw material from one location to the next. Was our design decision the best? Maybe we could have settled for a slightly different uh, metallic finish if we know it's going to improve the logistics at the point of its uh, manufacture and assembly. So you really need to start taking into account all of these stakeholders when you're developing your product if you want the close to optimal solution. <clears throat> now these map on these stakeholders map onto these three key streams. So we have some kind of mean situation, a market, a product, production leading to business. And roughly speaking, the professions map on, such as marketing, sales, forecasting, user sales, design, engineering, aesthetics, ergonomics, manufacture, assembly, packaging, transport. So just to define what this integrated product development model is, it's an idealized model of product development where the business case of the product is built from the perspectives of all stakeholders. Our two products here, and I was responsible for working on the design of these. Which one is better? So I'm going to ask three questions now. You don't, you're not sure? This one is better, or this one is better? So hands up if you're not sure and you don't know which is better. Okay, uh -huh. Hands up if you think this product here is better. One, two. Hands up if you think this product here is better. About a quarter. Okay, so these products are basically simple inserts where you can drizzle olive oil, salad dressing, and so on, uh, on your food. So they go into the bottle and the cap goes over the top. When you release the cap, the user can drizzle their olive oil. But how do we decide which one is better? Well, one thing we can do is think of it in terms of these three strands of integrated product development. What I'd like you to do now, just in, in your teams, perhaps in your entrepreneurship teams, try and do a quick comparison with regards to its market, functionality of the product and ease of production, a comparison of these two products. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes now, turn and face your teams and discuss. I have a question about the crate one. How do you get it out of the bottle? <laughs> this one here? Yeah. Uh, the idea is it's not supposed to get out of the bottle. Uh, the, the liquid flows through here and out. And the same with this one, they're disposable items, they're supposed to. Okay. 
and feel free to ask any clarifying questions. Huh? Incidentally, if you're not in a team, go and join somebody else. Siis ta on nagu pudelis ees tereministi. Jah, aga see teisele saab kaatma. Mulemalt teha. Ja see saab pärast tuule juba külakaudu. Kilast kinni võttes nii võtta välja. Kõik kus näe jaoks mõelda. Siis on poole pärast see teine Ma arvan, et pead töös on mõned sama äsja, kui nüüd, et võtta selle vasakool, seal on nagu sa ei saa nii-öelda korki vahepeal peale. Okei, juht päris, et sa saab suurgida seda pilt. Jah, just nüüd, jah. Aga teisel saab, et sa jääb sinna. Okei, see on sama sellegi, sama sellegi, noh. Või jah, igasugust tilast rääkides, siis noh. Okay. So can I have a volunteer to suggest at the market level, how do these two, how do you differentiate between these two products? You look like you want to volunteer. No. <laughs> Nobody knows. Do you think these two products hold the same market position? Well, which one do you think is a more premium product? Premium is uh, on the right side, that one is more premium. Do you think this one is more premium? Premium as in better? Yeah, well, premium as in higher value to the end user. Okay, interesting. Because it's a premium model, so it's easier to understand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I should have probably put two physical uh, products in if I'd have got them in my bag. Uh, assume they are both physical products, not a 3D model and they are. So who think, well, to be honest, I think this one's more premium. For one, it's got a functioning part. Uh, this pops out uh, when the lid comes off and you can direct your product easier. Um, and it's something that extends from the product. In my opinion, this one is more premium. So we could say this one is high-end, uh, premium, and has brand differentiation, whereas this is perhaps considered a functional mid-range product on the market. So at the product level of how well these products function, do you have any suggestions on how they differ? Uh, the one on the right side is to which you throw, throw away. Uh, as I assume, the one on the left side is, uh, let's say, you can use it several times. It could do, but I, I think it's actually designed so you can throw it away as well as a throwaway. But, um, but which one do you think functions better? Which is easier to use? The one on the right side? No. Okay. Left side. Yeah, left side. Left side. Left side. Left side. Okay. Well, I would say that for start, this one is relatively complex, so it can malfunction because you've got moving parts, you can jam. It is cleaner in operation because this spout extends from the bottle mm. and you can guide it better. And also, because of this expanded spout, it's easier to direct uh, the pouring fluid, rather than whatever it is. This one is simple, very easy to use in the sense you don't have to do anything or understand anything, um, but it's less clean in operation. So they function in quite different ways, um, and they hold different markets. Now at the production level, which do we think is the, uh, well, how do they differ in terms of how easy they are to produce? Any other reasons why one is more easy than the other? Left one needs assembly also. Exactly, yeah. So this one has three parts, two materials as you say, requires assembly process. This one is a single piece mold. The molding of these two pieces is probably similar complexity, but basically this one is much simpler, or it requires it inserted into the bottle. 
So if we ask which of these two products is better, we really don't know. We have to think about, for a start, what production equipment do we have? Which one of these has most value to us? Do the users really value this extra functionality of the extended spout that can pour it? Do the brands think this extra spout provides higher brand differentiation? Or do the production team think this is substantially easier that they can knock the price of this component down into a more competitive range? So these are the things you have to consider when evaluating which product is better. Now there are some extreme cases, so if we take uh, the simple juicer versus the Philip Stark juicer. Now I think this one is cheaper, quicker and easier to produce without a shadow of a doubt. It's lighter, more sturdy, cheaper, I think a much better functioning product. It's much easier to contain a juice afterwards. But it doesn't really have any wow factor or market differentiation. Now, I think you'd be a bit crazy to suggest that this was a more successful product than this one. So although it beats in two, two areas, you have to understand where the value lies. So in this case, there is minimal value in these differentiating in these areas. But, oops, but it turned out, oops, but it turned out there was a, a large value in making this market differentiation as a piece of art uh, in the kitchen. So moving on, uh, something engineers typically do is consider the bottom two elements of this integrated product development model. Designing a functioning product that can be easy to produce. Um, and the way we do this is using what's called DFX methods, designed for the purpose of assembly or manufacture or serviceability. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. This is a, uh, an old Ford, um, and some engineer thought it was really clever the way they constrained uh, the lens of the headlamp here, because they actually gave a few number of bolts and fixed it hard behind the bumper. Which is quite a clever way of doing it in a way, but then when you need to replace your head bolt, headlamp bolt, so all of a sudden your headlamp isn't working anymore, you have to take the bumper off to get the lens cap off to get to replace the bulb. That equates to disassembling 32 items and reassembling 32 items, and all you want to be able to do is take a bolt in and out. So this is a typical case where the designer has thought about the functioning product but hasn't thought about the future use cases or the other uh, the stakeholders. They haven't thought about the service team in this. So they could have redesigned this for this purpose of service. There are some other very good examples, particularly coming out of the 80s. Uh, the Apache Longbow helicopter had estimated savings of 1.3 billion by redesigning this product for the purpose of manufacture and assembly. And a typical example was this, uh, uh, this uh, flare bracket, anti-flare bracket, sorry. And these two are basically the same product. They function in the same way, but one consists of five sheet metal parts, 19 rivets, 20 tools needed, 32 hours of manufacture. They invested in a new uh, high-speed lathe, uh, sorry, mini machine, and you have one high-speed machine Parts, two hours of manufacturing, 10% less weight, 45% less cost, tooling cost virtually eliminated, and no assembly. So absolutely enormous gains to be had from no functionality loss. Again, here's another example of a junk seat assembly containing 105 separate parts, 1,440 seconds of assembly time, um, and could easily be turned into this, which is reduced to 19 parts with five major sub-assemblies. Now the sub-assemblies are quite important because it means you can assemble one sub-assembly, the other five assemblies, and then you join them all together afterwards, rather than just one component at a time. So that's an assembly strategy. Here's some other examples. Here's a, a typical corner piece for housing. Again, made up of multiple parts when you could have just had one uh, molded bracket doing exactly the same function. Some plastic uh, fasteners, so we have a, a peg, two pieces of wood, and a metal clip, 
quite difficult assembly. We could just have a one piece plastic mould here with an integral hinge. And this bell uh, it looks like a piece of crap, but to, to me as an engineer, this is a thing of beauty. Um, you have one plastic moulded part here, which at the same time connects the bell to the handlebars using this feature. In the same moulding, you have a little actuator for the bell to ring the bell, and then the housing to hold the bell case. All in one moulding. Think about how many parts there are in it. It's probably about six or seven parts. So, although it's a piece of crap, it's still got some virtues to it. Now, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I, I presume those are the, the engineering issues that you're not so concerned about with your product's development, but nevertheless, when you talk to engineers and people who are going to be producing your product, understand why they might be getting frustrated, understand why they have certain concerns, because they have to consider all these types of things. So at least it gives you a, a platform where you can communicate to these types of people. Now, I think, I'm second guessing, but I guess you're more interested in making a product that's suitable to the marketplace. And to do that, I'm going to suggest a strategy called product service systems. Instead of just selling a product, we could try to consider selling a product with a service system around it. Now, just in your, in your groups that you're working in a second ago, I'd like you to try and have a go at defining what is a product and what is a service, and use the phrase, value is created, and the term stakeholder in both definitions. So I'm just going to give you two minutes to do that. Let me know if you don't understand that. Following on from this lecture, you may want to consider how much your business is a product model and how much is a service model. Okay, so would anyone like to share how they've defined these two terms? Or we'll start with a product? Go ahead. Product or service is something that creates value to all the stakeholders. Okay, that's a product or service, and I'd agree with that. So what is the difference between the two then? Any one suggestions? is physical, the other is more mental. One is physical, one is more mental, possibly, but you could have digital products perhaps. Yeah. One is a one-time purchase and another one is a continuous Hey, that's that's getting close. That's pretty good. Value uh, is created uh, for service when uh, the service is produced, while uh, uh, value for uh, created by product uh, when it is used. Absolutely, and those are both absolutely true points, and we'll be getting back to that in a moment. Um, the terms that we tend to use in our community, produced by uh, Tim McLoon, suggest that. I, Product is the result of a synthesis process where value is created through transferring ownership from one stakeholder to another. And I think you're right. It only adds value when it's being used, uh, the product. And then a service is the creation of value when one stakeholder carries out an activity on behalf of another. So that's, in my opinion, a very good way to think about services and products. And you should probably think about whether your company is a service orientated uh, company or a product orientation. 
Now, if we think about a typical product life cycle, from raw materials, manufacturer assembly, and so on and so on, if it's a product, at what point do we make money from our product? At what point in this life cycle do we make money? Sales. And it's basically only the sales. So the product goes through all of these life phases, we sell it, we make the money, and we transfer the ownership to the customer. One of the problems with doing that is we transfer the ownership to the customer, but we still have some kind of liability. So if the product fails or hurts someone or does something terrible, we're still liable for it, even though we don't own it or we're making any money from it at this stage. Now the service strategy or the PSS strategy is to say, well, okay, we can sell the product, but then we're also going to try and make money back through services during its installation, make services during its use phase and its maintenance and perhaps even its disposal. So you can add services to these various phases throughout the product life cycle. And the nice thing is, the well, the idea behind it is that the uh, producer continues some kind of ownership or relationship with the product. The idea is it's not just transferred to the uh, person at the point of sale, but the user and the producer continues to somehow own or have some responsibility over it. And we'll go back to that in a moment. <clears throat> so the PSS business strategy is to make a shift of focus from a business based on value creation through transfer of product ownership and responsibility to a business based on value creation through the support uh, and delivery of a service from a product for the whole of its lifetime. Now some case examples, Rolls-Royce, years ago Rolls-Royce, the aircraft, uh, the aero section of Rolls-Royce, not the motors, years ago they made money through the sale of aircraft engines. They changed their business model, does anyone know how they changed it? Go ahead. They rent the uh, uh, engine hours or on hotel? Couldn't be put much better, they rent the engine hours. Basically, instead of selling an engine, Rolls-Royce sell power by the hour. So they sell thrust, essentially. And that's what the, the aircraft company wants. As long as they, they can buy the thrust to get them from one place to another, that's all they need. So the aircraft don't own the engines, Rolls-Royce do. And it means whenever the air, um, engines need maintaining, Rolls-Royce are there to do it. The other reason this is an important one because Rolls-Royce have close contact with their aircraft engines. That means whenever anything's going wrong, Rolls-Royce know about it and they know how to feed it back into their design loop so they can have continuous improvement in their products. It's also a better relationship with customers because you're in constant contact. And the other thing is, um, provide onboard diagnosis. So during its flights, they can actually put services within this so that they can uh, get understanding of how the aircraft engine is performing during its use phase. Danfoss, uh, they're a Danish company who make or have made refrigeration equipment in the past. So they sell things like refrigerators, thermostats, and so on. Can anyone suggest how they may have transformed their business to a more service orientated? Instead of selling uh, fridges, what could they have sold? Motor. Sorry? Just the motor. Just the motor. Well, that's even more product orientated. <laughs> so what they did was try to go the other way. Instead of just selling these products, they realized that they, their customers would have thermostats and refrigeration units inside the same room as they'd have heaters, air conditioning units, all kinds of uh, heat sensitive equipment. So they realized what they needed to sell was not just a product, but a consulting service around cooling solutions. So where meat or things needed refrigerated, Danfoss would come in and set up this entire refrigeration area to say, okay, here's where we have the ventilation so that this doesn't interfere with this and so on and so on. So it was a much better solution for the customers. 
Xerox. They sold your used to sell photocopiers. What do you think they do now? What's their business model now? Selling licenses. Licenses to what? To photocopiers, maybe? Very close. They, they license out their photocopiers, but they license out an entire service. So they say, you're going to need to sign up to our service where you use our photocopiers, we will supply you and sell you paper and ink toner, and we'll make sure your photocopier is up and running constantly. So, People who are buying it get a much better deal. Um, and Xerox uh, make constant revenue. Instead of selling one photocopy at a time, they make constant revenue through this close contact with the customers. This is a, um, a company in Denmark who produce um, organic veg. And they could have gone through the normal route where they produce organic veg, they sell it to supermarkets, and people go to the supermarket and buy it, or selling it over a veg counter. But it said it wasn't working. So they tried to serviceize this and turn it into a delivery business. So they deliver veg boxes with recipes of what to do with the veg to people's doors in Denmark. They turn this product into a service, which is of much more higher value. Dow Egberts. Now, hopefully you should get this one by now. Dow Egberts used to sell coffee makers and coffee. They used to sell product. What do you think they sell now? <laughs> and you, you, you're going in the other direction because it's product <laughs> or raw materials. They're providing uh, or refilling all the machines on the site? Basically, yeah. So, very similar to the Xerox model, they lease out their coffee machines mm -hmm. and then they make sure that these coffee machines are stacked with their produce which they charge for. So, instead of selling these things, they keep their ownership of it and just lease it out and make money through the sale of filters and beans and so on. IBM, which we know used to produce electronic hardware and now has moved almost completely to the consultancy side. DuPont, they're car paint producers. So they produce paints for cars and they used to sell the paint. How have they serviced their business? Any idea what service they can provide around the paint? Paint in the cars, I guess. Paint in the cars? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think we're getting it, surely. Um, so the idea is instead of just selling tins of paint, they sell painted cars. Now, why is that a good idea? Well, particularly for DuPont, it's a good idea because they sell high quality paint. Somebody does a crappy job of painting this car. And all of a sudden, their paint looks terrible on this car. So it looks really bad because they haven't had control of the use phase of this paint. So their paint all of a sudden looks terrible because somebody has provided a terrible paint job. So instead, they say, well, Ford, you bring your, um, your cars in and we'll use our paint to coat your cars and we can guarantee you great coverage of the automobile and so on. So they provide this service instead of just the product and they get more value from it. And this is the last one, EasyJet. This is a little bit more different and difficult, but can anyone say why EasyJet was a service innovation? Go ahead. No, just tell everything about the insurance is to uh, easier for the plane. Say again? No, they didn't sell everything. They're all products on the plane. Exactly. Um, well, not only do they sell things on the plane, but they also sell things such as insurance, uh, cars, accommodation, because they think about the entire life of the customer's activity.